just I, we, our printer, I guess, doesn't like cold weather either. So we had trouble printing our bulletins. Uh, so I just want to make a couple of verbal announcements. Jennifer is doing is starting a Bible study at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Cassville, and it happens on Tuesday, starting this Tuesday, the 16th, and it's at 6:30 in the evening. She's going to be doing the through the Bible series. And if you'd like to attend that, if you've never been a part of that particular study, it's fantastic. And so I would encourage you to be a part of that. Of course, if they, her rule is kind of similar to ours. If Cassville doesn't have school, they won't be having their Bible study there. Um, and then, of course, our women's Bible study was start, supposed to start tomorrow night here, or tomorrow morning and tomorrow night. And if, of course, if Dr. Graham so chooses to eliminate school tomorrow uh, or cancel it, then we will also be canceling our Bible studies here. So just pay attention to the news. And anytime we do anything like this, I want you to do what's best for you to stay safe. So make the best choice for you. Um, so well, and that being said, would you pray with me? And we'll get started. Father, we thank you for the love you've shown us. And Lord, I'm so grateful for this church family. May you be exalted in all things. May you hear the cry of our worship and know that we love you and that we see you as the supreme love of our life. We give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor that is due to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, here, who here knows what Twitter is? Are you familiar with Twitter? Do you use Twitter? I know some of the older adults, the more seasoned of us, probably have no clue what Twitter is. But So let me just give you a brief background here. You've got to think of Twitter as kind of being a big digital bulletin board. It's kind of where people go to share notes or uh, ideas. It's kind of like sticky notes on a community board. And anytime you have a thought or, or you want to say something interesting, you can write a little short message, you can share a photo, you can share a short video, and then with a push of a button, just like that, it's like sticking that note on the bulletin board for other people to see. And the cool part is that if there is somebody that is on Twitter that you want to keep up with, you can choose to quote unquote follow them. And it's kind of like saying, hey, I want to see all the notes that this person sticks up on the bulletin board. And then whenever you open that particular app on your phone, you can, anytime they post something new, it will appear in a list of all the other people that you're following and what they have to say. And you, your phone can even be set to get a heads up every time somebody posts a particular idea. Uh, and you can read it, you can respond to it. You, you, you can share it with someone else. It, it's, it's a bit like a quick digital community that anybody can join. And, and whenever you put something out there, the whole world can see it. And in the Twitterverse, they've changed it now. It's called X. But the guy that bought it, Elon Musk, maybe you've heard of that guy. Maybe If you're not, he's the guy that came up with the idea of Tesla um, and SpaceX. He has more followers on his Twitter than anybody else. He's number one. 169 million people follow what Musk has to say. You got any clue who number two is? Number two is our former president, Barack Obama. Barack has 132 million followers. And then uh, coming up in third is not me. Uh, I'm close, but not quite. It's Justin Bieber. And so I know some of you would be interested and excited about hearing Justin Bieber has uh, 111 million followers. And on Twitter, when you're fo these, the people that follow them on Twitter, they hang on their every word. And, and so these, notice how I'm calling them followers. Anytime Biebs posts a picture of him, with his shirt off, hanging around the pool, all those teen girls can just go crazy, you know. They, they can see it right there on their Twitter feed. Uh, but being a follower of someone on Twitter is nothing like being a follower in the, in the context of what I've been talking about the last two weeks. 
I mean, following Barack on Twitter is nothing like following Jesus. When you follow Barack, right, it's relatively simple, uh, low involvement, pain-free way to keep up with what he has to say on certain topics or certain things that happen in the world. And for the most part, engaging with someone on Twitter, you know, following them, there, you don't have to have any personal knowledge of that person. There's really not any personal interaction that happens with these people. And there's no rules. You can follow whoever you like. You can even, if they make you mad, you can even unfollow them. And there's no commitment whatsoever. And, and get this, you can choose to follow someone on Twitter and then completely ignore anything and everything that they put on Twitter. Anything they have to say. You don't have to read it. You can just ignore it and still be a follower. <laughs> there, there's a huge contrast between what we've been talking about being a follower and then being a follower on Twitter because, you know, in fact... You, it's, it's possible on Twitter for you to follow two people with entirely different views that, that, are, that are virtual enemies. You can follow Patrick Mahomes, and you can follow Tom Brady at the same time. Nobody cares, right? It, it, there's no exclusivity to that. Uh, but whenever we talk about following Jesus... That doesn't mean simply keeping up with him or checking in on him periodically. It, it is the call to follow Jesus with radical discipleship. And, and if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to be a disciple. And so if you've, we didn't print very many of them. I think there's 10 or so study guides out there. If you've got one of them, you can see, you can follow along here, number one. Thing that we'll see about disciples is that disciples spend a lot of time with Jesus because that's what a disciple does. It's a follower and they're a pupil. In our current culture, you would probably associate being a disciple best with being an apprentice. And I'm not talking about Trump's television show either. I'm not talking about that. When you're an apprentice for someone in our world, you're typically learning that trade or that skill under their guidance. It's a mentor-apprentice relationship, and this person is an experienced professional, and you're just starting off, and so you're going to sit under their teaching. I've recently watched this television show, of course, on Netflix, and it's called Blown Away. And there are contestants that compete to see who can make the most creative works out of molten glass, and they're glass blowers. You've probably seen them at Silver Dollar City, haven't you? Those guys that take just a, a piece of glass and then they heat it up. I, I, I'm amazed at that craft. They, they melt that glass or they heat it up until it's almost liquid, and then they begin to manipulate that molten glass into incredible works of art or common household items. Um, but... As I'm watching something like that, either on Netflix or you go down to Silver Dollar City, I begin to ask the question, how does even one become a glass blower? I mean, whenever I was in school, I, there wasn't glass blowing 101. It wasn't like I could sign up for it. There wasn't, there wasn't a degree major called glass blower extraordinaire or anything. I didn't, couldn't get my PhD in glass blowing. How does somebody, if, if, I mean, if that's something that trips your trigger, how do you get that? How do you become a glass blower. Well, glass blowing, it, that is typically passed down through the process of being an apprentice, the, an apprenticeship. You see these accomplished glass blowers, these professionals, the ones that have been doing it most of their life, they will often take on apprentices and the apprentices will work closely with the master and they'll learn that craft and they'll develop their skills. And, and it's not even in glass blowing. That's not exclusive glass blowing either. I know many of you, the career that you're in, you actually learned your craft and your skills under the tutelage of, of another person, somebody that had been doing it for a long time. It's the same process. Being a disciple is kind of like being an apprentice. You sit under the tutelage of another person, 
And, and that person has mastered the craft, they've mastered the skill, and you sit under them and you learn what they learn. Many of the greatest characters in the Bible had disciples. Moses had Joshua. Elijah had Elisha. David had Solomon. And of course, if you've read through the New Testament, there at the beginning you see that John the Baptist, he had disciples. He had men that, that sat under his teaching and would listen to what he had to say because they wanted to be able to do what he does and know what he knows. In the New Testament, though, Jesus takes this idea uh, uh, and the meaning of being a disciple and he actually adds more weight to that term. Because being a follower of Jesus or being a disciple, the weight that he adds is, he says, it's much more than just being a follower. It's deeper than just mere belief. It's not like you're just admiring him from a distance on Twitter. Or it's even more than just acquiring knowledge from Jesus when you're his disciple. When you're his disciple, you're watching and you're listening and you're learning from him. But it's a little bit more of a commitment. Because to be a disciple of Jesus, you have to, you have to bind yourself to him. He, he, you have to become one with him. And, and, you, and you have to want to acquire his practical and theoretical knowledge. It's really, you have to commit to growing spiritually. That's what disciples do. They grow spiritually. And, and you'll never grow unless you're committed to the process. Have you ever noticed that any time you make a commitment in life, you grow because of that commitment? If you make a commitment to being a part of a, of a committee, you know what's going to happen? Your skill, your knowledge, your expertise in that field that you're part of that committee you're going to grow in those things. Think about your commitment in your marriage. When you make a commitment to be married, don't you grow as a human being? Don't you grow in how you understand how to love people? And anytime making a commitment is the path to growth. And you can't grow through osmosis. You know what osmosis is, don't you? Where it just kind of seeps out of one and into the other. I can remember whenever I was a kid had a big math test one night, and I forgot to study. But it's time to go to bed, so I figure what I'm going to do, I'm going to put my math book under my pillow, and I'm going to learn these calculations and these formulas by osmosis. It doesn't work that way, though, does it? You just can't put your head on the math book and automatically receive that information. And it's the same with being a disciple. You have to spend time with Jesus. You have to be intentional. And, and get this, if you really want to be a disciple of Jesus, your commitment to him has to be exclusive. You can't be committed to everything. Rick Warren says, if you're committed to everything, you're committed to nothing. And I believe that's true. Your, your commitment in this space of your life, it has to be exclusive. It, it, it's a full-time job. You, you will get out what you put in. In fact, a, a lot of people think that they can be a Christian, and then they realize that that means that I also have to be a disciple. That means that I have to learn under the tutelage of Jesus if I'm going to follow him. But then they're not willing to commit the time and effort it takes to grow spiritually. And it's almost like, I, I'm going to arrange my interaction with Jesus around my schedule, and it don't work like that. You, you see, you have to put him in your schedule and then arrange everything else around him. And we do this all the time. We do this, you know, the church, one of the things that we want to do here is disciple you to help you grow spiritually. We can't help you grow spiritually if you're not here. And so you, a lot of people, they structure their schedule uh, and, and then they try to fit church in wherever they can. 
wherever there's an empty spot. You see, you'll never grow spiritually doing that. Your commitment to following Jesus has got to be number one, the first thing, the first priority on your list, and then everything else is structured around that. And so you know automatically, hey, I need to be here on Sundays, I need to be here on Wednesdays for this Bible study because I want to grow spiritually. I want, I'm a disciple of Jesus and he wants me to do this. And then you organize your other activities around that. But a lot of times in our culture, people get that backwards. It's like, these things are important in my life, and so they get scheduled first, and then I'll fit Jesus in whenever I have time. When you do that, you never grow. You're missing opportunities to allow Jesus to speak into your life. Another thing about this idea of being committed as a disciple, that, and this is a truth that you really got to understand, is that the longer that you're committed to being a disciple, the more intense the demands of discipleship become. Think about this. When Jesus first meets his disciples, the first time he meets Peter, his invitation is just come, follow me. You know, there's, there's low impact right there. I mean, it's just, it's just a very simple, basic invitation, come follow me. But the longer that you serve Jesus, the requirements of his discipleship increase. And so it moves, you'll see your life with Christ move from this very basic invitation, hey, come follow me, into something that requires more and more of your time and more and more of, your, of yourself. Look at Luke 9, 23, I've got it on the screen, it says, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. You see, notice that he says, you have to give up your own way. Or in other translations, it says, deny yourself. I mean, this is absolute surrender to God. And in fact, in just a little, another chapter away, Luke 14, it says, you cannot be my disciple without giving up everything you own. You know, and then he says, you have to take up your cross. Taking up your cross symbolically for us today, when we use it in, in our conversations and we say, I guess I'll just have to pick up my cross, you know, and we use it to communicate this idea of a burden that we have to bear. It's symbolic of that. But when Jesus tells that first century audience, you need to take up your cross, that's not what it means to them. It doesn't mean, it doesn't refer to a simple burden. What it means is he's saying, I mean, they completely understood what the cross meant. The cross to them meant death. And so when Jesus tells them you have to take up your cross, it, he's calling them to self-abasement. He's calling them to self-sacrifice. Ultimately, the call to discipleship is a call to die. A, a call not only die possibly physically, but definitely you have to die spiritually to your old ways, to the, to the thoughts and desires that you have. Being a disciple moves from the very general basic idea of, hey, come check me out. Come and see. And the longer you do it, the more responsibility Jesus is going to ask from you. It gets more and more difficult. And the second thing we see about disciples is that they love God above everything else. It's very, very easy. When you love God above everything else, you're worshiping him. And, and if you want to be a disciple, here's the point. Your affection has to shift. The things that you love must change. Luke 14 says, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else, your father, your mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. So get that. He's saying, I have to be the number one love of your life. And not, not your mom. You can't love your mom more than me. You can't love your wife more than me. You can't love your children more than me. I have to be number one. And if you're unwilling to do that, he says, 
you cannot be my disciple. If you do not carry your own cross, that means if you're not willing to die, if you're not willing to die spiritually or, or even take the chance in dying physically, he says, you can't be my disciple. Anybody that wants to be a Jesus follower, you cannot love anything more than you love him. That includes your own self. It includes your, your spouse, includes your children, and, and a lot of times people have difficulty swallowing that truth. How, can, how, how am I supposed to love God more than I love my children? My children are right here. It's my responsibility to take care of them. They, they even in their mind, some people distort that idea. They warp it. It's, it's, it works kind of like, well, I guess I have to love Jesus to the detriment of my other relationships. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying, he's saying by comparison. He's commanding us to love him more than anything else and, and that our love for him should be so great that the love we have for our spouse and our children pales in comparison. And, and a lot of people have this in their mind that if, if, I, if I love him more than anything else, those people are going to suffer. They're not going to receive the affection or the attention that they need, which is completely wrong because it works kind of in the inverse. And it works like this. The, the more that you love God, the more you will love your children and your spouse. The love that we have for him fuels everything else in our life. And when you love Jesus supremely, your love for other people is not negatively affected. You'll actually love them more as you love God more. And you have to spend time, and you have to spend time in worship. And, and, and so everything else in life has to take a back seat to your relationship with Christ. And you know, one of the things that we find as, as leaders and pastors in churches, we find that it's possible to measure your spiritual growth by the depth of your love for God. The more that you love God, we, what, the more that you're increasing in your spiritual growth, we will see that it will equate to you will begin to love God more and more. But not only God, number three, disciples have to love other people as well. You know, remember, I made a point just a second ago that the longer that you follow Jesus, the greater the demand he places on us. And so it moves from come follow me, and then it increases in, in difficulty and intensity, and it comes to this point where it's way more difficult than loving God. He says, I need you to love other people. I mean, it's natural. It's easy for us to love God. Loving others... <laughs> not so much, right? Some people are difficult to love. But as disciples, that's the mandate on our life. John 13, 35 says, Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. You want to prove to the world that you are a Jesus follower? You want people to know that? How best to show that you follow Jesus than to love other people? And whenever it says others, you know what it's talking about, right? It's talking about the church. You can't love God and hate his bride. You can't love God and hate the church. If you love God and you hate the church, you're really not a disciple. Anyone can come up with reasons to dislike this place, right? I know that there are people that have had bad experiences in churches. There are people that, have, uh, that will claim, I'm not going to go to that church. It's just full of fake people. You know, and, and it's true. The, this is a place of imperfect people. We don't get it right. There's going to be people in that church that have hurt you outside that church. But you know what? We're all broken people. You're broken people. And the mandate is, you have to find a way to love other people. Or you're not on the list. You don't qualify. You're not a disciple. 
You see, Christ died for this church. And disciples do what they see their rabbi doing. And when you see your rabbi go to the cross on behalf of his bride, then you need to be willing to die for the church. But the, the fact is we see people all the time. You know, I love Jesus, but I'm not going to cross the street for the church. Well, if that's true, i kind of got news for you. Uh, you may not want to go to heaven because it's going to be populated with people that is the church. These people that you've been avoiding all this time here on the planet, uh, that's going to be who's in heaven. So you're probably going to be miserable. Learn to love the church. You see, the Apostle John, he addressed the idea of loving God and hating others. He says in 1 John 4.20, if someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. And so if you say you love God, but you don't like the church, you don't, you don't like the people of the church, you don't like other Christians, here's what John says. You can say all day long that you love God, but if at the same time in your heart you're harboring hate for other people in the church, clause number one is false. You're a liar. You can't love him and hate his bride. And, and don't forget, don't neglect the impact that other people have on your spiritual growth. I mean, you can't grow spiritually unless you're in a community. That's the reason why we make such a big deal out of attending a Sunday school class or being a part of a small group. It, it's God set it up this way. It's a requirement that you'll be in fellowship with other people. You, there is no way that you'll ever learn to love someone else if you refuse to be around someone else. You've got to be around other peoples. And, and some religions, it's encouraged. Isolation's encouraged. They, they say, separate yourself. You know, go join a commune. Go live in a monastery. Climb to the, the peak of the mountain and set Indian style and and put your fingers like this. You know, that's, some religions advocate that. But when you follow Jesus, you have to do what Jesus does. And what do we see Jesus do all through Scripture during his time on earth? The only time Jesus really isolated himself was kind of in the early morning when he needed to go and, and, and spend time with God without any distractions. The majority of Jesus' time on this planet he spent with other people. He was out in the crowds. He would walk through the marketplaces. He would go to the parties. And, and in fact, his opponents would use his behavior to defame him. They would point out he hangs out with drunkards. He hangs out with prostitutes and sinners. He eats with people who are unclean. That's the knock that they had on him. I think it just points to the truth that Jesus knows that we have to love other people. And you show love to other people by being present. And you can always tell, if you want to know this morning, how do I know if I'm growing spiritually? How can I tell? You can tell that you're growing spiritually if you feel and you know that you are beginning to love God more and at the same time you're beginning to love others better. So kind of wrap all this up so we can get out of here before the snow starts flying. Following Jesus means that we have to be disciples of Jesus. And being a disciple means that you're making a commitment to learn his ways and then mimic his ways. You, you begin to think like he does. And I think what's really key for a lot of us is Knowing what Jesus knows, I then use that information to process life according to the views that he has on life. I, I don't understand how Christians can separate and, and, and they can segment parts of their life without applying what Jesus would say to that part of life. You see, if you're a Christian, what Jesus is teaching is, it, it, its fingers should reach into every part of our life. What Jesus teaches should impact how you vote. What Jesus teaches should impact what, how you talk about other people. 
What Jesus teaches should impact how you work. Christians should be the most reliable, dependable employees on the planet. But this thing, these things just don't happen overnight. They don't just mysteriously wake up someday and, and, in, and a, you know, pop, I have the mind of Christ. It's a process. You have to be intentional. You have to invest in becoming like your master. But it comes at a cost. And I would ask this morning for those that may not have that relationship or may not be classified as a follower of Jesus, or maybe you are, here's the question I'd ask. Is, are you ready to take up your cross and follow him? I, I, I would say, if you are, beware. Beware about stepping into that commitment because you'd better count the cost because willing to follow Jesus means you could lose your closest friends. If you're willing to follow Jesus, it means that you might be alienated from your family. I've seen that happen in third world countries where people have made professions of faith and their family kicks them out or writes them out of the will or removes some sort of asset from their life. You know, following Jesus means that you could lose your reputation. Following Jesus means the possibility of losing your job. And in extreme situations, following Jesus may mean that you could lose your life. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to be that committed? That's what he's calling you to. There's no clause that he gives for someone to take an easier path that you can commit to part-time. Following Jesus is ultimately a call to die. He deserves and he demands your complete devotion to him, even if it means you have to die. And unless you're willing to do those things, you will never be known as a Jesus follower. And being a Jesus follower is the greatest privilege that man has ever been allowed to have. So I'd implore you, yes, you can love God, but that call to follow Jesus is entirely different. And it requires so much more of us. Please count the cost. Let's pray. Lord, we're just so grateful for your word, and Lord, your word is its powerful, it's impactful, but at times, Lord, it can be difficult. Even contemplating the, the possibility that binding myself to you might mean my life, it's intimidating, it's scary, and a lot of people can't aren't willing to pay that cost. And Lord, I just pray that people would, know, would, would come to know just how fulfilling that, that commitment is. Lord, it is, a, it is a greater blessing than anything that we will ever know this side of being with you in heaven. And so, Lord, I just pray this morning that you would fill us with courage and that your word would, would prick our hearts and it, we would be motivated to lay aside everything that keeps us from going all in. All in for the glory of your name. And that's who we pray to this morning. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hi, thank you for watching. If you want to see more great content like this, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to ring the little bell to be notified when we add new videos. Since our founding in 1877, our goal here at Arnhart has been to create God-centered teaching available for everyone, regardless of their status or station. Today, that looks like making trustworthy Bible teaching available to everyone, even if they don't make it to a church building on Sunday. So for more information, check out our website at arnhart.org or join us live on Facebook Sundays at 1045 a.m. 
As always, we love you and hope to see you next Sunday.